Hey, what's up guys? Great to be with you today here at Meta Church. My name is Ricky. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I'm excited to jump into the message. Uh, and as we get started, here's what you need to know about me, okay? Some of you already know this, but if you don't know me, if you've not met me, or if you've not been around for any period of time, what you need to know about me is I'm a huge sports fan, particularly or specifically like major league sports. So I love um, the NFL. I love major league baseball. It's more, I'm really more, I love like the New York Yankees, even though they've been trash this year. Uh, and I especially, my all-time, like my utmost like favorite um, sports league is NBA basketball. I'm a, I'm a Knicks fan, been a Knicks fan pretty much my whole life. Uh, and so I love all things NBA. And so uh, a couple weeks ago, um, it, 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 I, ca- I saw a headline that, that caught my attention. And it was like five worst NBA trades of the last five years. Five worst NBA trades of the last five years. And this was kind of like the image uh, that they had uh, that you're seeing up on the screen. And um, maybe if you follow NBA basketball, you know who those players are. It's James Harden and Ben Simmons on this graphic. But there was uh, five different trades that they were evaluating and they were reviewing and that they had categorized as the five worst trades of the last five years. Now, I'll spare you the details about who was traded and what was given up and all of those things. Um, But I will explain to you how an NBA trade works, okay? Now, all, I, would assume, I would assume all of us are familiar with trades on some level, right? The idea, the basic premise of a trade is that you give up one thing in exchange for another thing. Well, NBA trades work pretty much in that same way. You're giving up players or assets or cash even in exchange for another set of players or another set of picks or assets to come down the road. And so there's you know, some different nuance with like financials and um, what teams are capable of doing or what they're permitted to do. But by and large, the basic premise of a trade is exactly like what you and I would experience in a normal trade that we would engage in. You're giving up one thing for another thing. You're giving up something or some player in exchange for someone else, which means that at every, in every trade, there's a level of sacrifice that is required at every trade. It doesn't matter what the trade is. doesn't matter who the trade is for. There's some level of sacrifice that's involved or that's required. Now, some of the trades referenced in this article that I read um, involve some pretty high caliber players, like all-star level players, meaning players who were performing at a higher level than their peers and their counterparts. And so these are guys that were pretty impactful. Other trades involve future Hall of Famers, like a Hall of Famer is someone who's kind of designated or been voted in by a group of uh, a panel of electors who have said, this guy or this person is one of the best to ever play the game, one of the best to ever put on a uniform. And so some of the traits involve future Hall of Famers. So clearly people who have um, played a significant role and, and, and um, have been incredibly valuable to their teams. Other trades involve like future draft picks and assets. So a team banking on or betting on, well, I'll get this player and I'll give up, you know, this future potential in exchange for what I know is a guaranteed or an assurance of what I believe is a guarantee right now in the present. And so all of these trades like, were made and, and all of these sacrifices were made. And in some cases, in some of these trades, obviously some of them are designated as the five, these are designated as the five worst in the last five years. Someone won and someone lost. Some of these, tra- or some of these trades or some of these um, players were traded and, and, and there was a belief or a hope that maybe something would happen, but nothing happened. And, 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 and this article kind of got me thinking. It got me thinking because every general manager who was involved in those five trades every person who was involved in the decision-making process, um, what was willing to make that sacrifice at that time, despite the fact that, you know, five years later, we look and say that was a really terrible decision. But at that time and in that moment, every general manager was willing to make that sacrifice. And, And I couldn't help but wonder, like, why? Why is that? Why is it that every GM, that every general manager was willing to make a trade, willing to make a sacrifice of an all-star caliber player, willing to make the sacrifice of a future Hall of Famer, willing to make the sacrifice of future potential for that present moment. Like, why why was it that they believed or or that they were so willing to make that sacrifice? And and as I thought about that, it kind of hit me. And and here's why I think that is. Here's, Here's the answer that I believe. I believe it's because we inherently believe sacrifice is necessary if we're going to get better. We, all of us, inherently believe that sacrifice is necessary if we're going to get better. Every general manager that made that trade was willing to make the sacrifice because they ultimately believe that it would make them or their team or their position better either in the present or in the future. 
Now you would say, well, th that's not always true. Yes, it is because their jobs, their livelihoods are dependent upon the outcomes of these trades. And so every general manager was willing to make that trade because they believe this sacrifice is gonna make me better. And listen, I believe, we inherently believe this because we know this or we experience this to be true. It's just part of our nature. It's just part of our makeup. We, we understand that, that if things are going to be, get better at some point, it's gonna require some level of sacrifice, some level of um, commitment to that sacrifice. Say, I have to like kind of, exchange this for that. Like I have to trade for more. I have to uh, kind of believe in this, right? Like think about like, we may not always like it, but if you think about the areas or you think about the examples in your life, like for instance, I'll just kind of, you know, spout off a few. Think about your health and your fitness, right? Like if you want to get in better health or if you want to get in better shape and you want to be like better at fitness, like it's going to require some sacrifice, a financial sacrifice to, to work, at, uh, work out at a gym or, or with a trainer, uh, a, a time sacrifice where you have to get up earlier or, or stay up late. Um, and you have to commit a, an amount of time, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it might be to improve your fitness. If you want to get better in um, your studies or your academics, um, it's going to require, you know, a sacrifice that you're putting in more time, you know, staying up late, working on that paper, reading up on those assignments, submitting that work, um, doing that research, right? And so there's, there's a level of sacrifice in order to get better at that. You think about parenting, those of us who are parents, right? Like a lot of parents, they say, you know, I just want to provide a, a better upbringing for my kids than what I had or than what I experienced. And that requires sacrifice. Like if I want my daughter to have a better upbringing than, than what I had, it's going to require sacrifice, financial sacrifice, uh, time sacrifice, um, you know, discipline, commitment, all those different things. It's going to require sacrifice as a parent. And same is true in relationships. If you want your relationships to be better, romantic relationship or just a friendship, if you want that to be better, it requires sacrifice on some level, right? Like, let's be honest, like the relationships we don't like are the relationships that are kind of like, uh, I'm okay if I don't see that person for a while. Probably because there's some level of distrust, some level where you feel like you've overcommitted or you've given more than that other person has been willing to reciprocate or to put into the relationship. So this same principle, you know, like it exists in all of these different areas of our lives. And this is important to know because I believe this same principle exists or is also necessary to what we experience in community. You know, last week I, I talked about being engaged in our community and, and, and the power of being engaged and how it's important for us as a church to, to re-engage that for so many years it's kind of been easy to disengage, but now it's the time and now it's important for us to, to re-engage fully and, 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 and how that community is so important. But I don't think we always connect the dots between community and sacrifice. See, when we think of community, it's, it's highly unlikely that the first thing that comes to mind or one of the top three or five, maybe even the top 10, top 10 things that come to mind when you think about community, uh, you probably wouldn't list sacrifice. But here's what I know. The healthiest and the strongest communities are always, always made up of members committed to sacrifice. Let me say it again for you in case you missed it or in case you're listening to the podcast while you're driving down the road. The healthiest and the strongest communities are always made up of members who are committed to sacrifice. Again, let me give you a few examples, right? Let me just list off different types of communities that you may have been a part of or that you may be a part of currently. Think about your friend groups. Okay, think about a group of friends. Maybe it's a group of friends that you've had since college. Maybe it's a group of friends that you have in your school. Maybe it's a group of friends that you have from church. Um, that community, that's a, so, a small, like a subsect, right? It's a small community. You, two, three, maybe six, seven, eight other friends. But that community, what you realize is like if it's healthy, if it's strong, it's because there's a level of sacrifice. If someone's sick or if someone needs something, like someone is willing to go be with them, to, to meet with them, to care for them, to support them. Uh, you, you've committed to one another. You've sacrificed for the sake of the community, for the sake of the friend group. If you've ever been a part of a sports team, you know that, that the healthiest and the strongest sports teams, there's been sacrifice. Everyone's committed to, to, to putting in the work, to putting in the effort, to, to being there on time, to, to partnering, to supporting each other, um, to, to believing the best about one another. There's sacrifice that's involved in those teams. I mean, shoot, even think about like fans, right? Like fanatics, people who uh, like music fans, um, um, sports fans, like where are my Swifties at, right? Like everyone, you know, you see these things on like, you know, this Eras tour and everyone's traveling all over the place um, to go see Taylor Swift in concert. And it's like, there's even in that like stadium or that arena, there's like this 
this like sense of like we're in this together. We've all sacrificed to be here. We've all committed to being here. Same when you go to a sporting event. It's like the fans are tailgating. They're outside in the parking lot. You know, they've got the jerseys on. They've paid for the tickets. Like you've sacrificed to be a part of that community experience. So we understand that the healthiest and the strongest communities are made up of members who are committed to sacrifice. So if this is true, if this is true, then why are we so resistant to sacrifice? If we know that sacrifice is needed in healthy and strong communities, then why are we so reluctant to sacrifice? See, I don't know about you, but to me, it kind of seems like the word sacrifice has, has become like a dirty word of sorts. It's something we don't want to hear. It's something we don't want to you know, partake in, especially when someone else is telling you to sacrifice. You see, if I, if I decide that I want to sacrifice something, well, okay, I'll give up that food because I want to be, um, I want to focus on my health. And I make that decision, then okay, I'll tolerate it. But if someone else says, if my doctor says to me, hey, Ricky, you got to give up that food because you're, you got to focus on your health. I'm like, I don't know, doc. I don't know if I want to make that sacrifice. I don't know if I want to make that type of commitment. That, like, that's when I have a problem, right? And, and probably for most, if not all of us, that same holds true, right? Like if we make the decision to sacrifice, then like we'll deal with it. But if someone else is telling us to make the sacrifice, then it's like, no, 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 no. Who are you to tell me what to sacrifice? And listen, in 15 plus years of pastoral ministry, I've seen this to be true. And I've learned this is especially true when it comes to the church. That when a pastor or when a church leader or a ministry leader encourages the people, invites the people to sacrifice and says, hey, listen, we've got to sacrifice in order to get better. We've got to sacrifice in order to, like, to, to get more, to experience more. The people are like, no, 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 no. Like someone else can sacrifice, but I'm not sacrificing anymore. I'm not giving up more. That's not for me. That does not apply for me. You're talking to the wrong person. Listen, and if you continue talking about that, then we might have some problems. So again, why is that? Why is that? Well, I think it's because we lack a proper perspective and understanding of what it means to sacrifice. Of what it means to sacrifice. And here, here's what I mean by that. Our English word sacrifice comes from two Latin words. Okay, it's, it's of Latin origin and it comes from two Latin words. The first word is facere, which, is, which means to make or to do. And then the second word is sacra, which we see at the beginning, which is holy or sacred. So sacrifice means to make holy or to make sacred or to do something holy or to do something sacred. So when you make a sacrifice, that is exactly what you're doing. See, too often, I think our perspectives or our feelings around sacrifice make it seem like or make it feel like we're losing like we've given up something that we're never going to retrieve or that it's like been purposeless. Like, well, I just, yeah, I just blew that money or I just wasted that time or I just lost that relationship or I just, I'll never get that part of my life back. And we assume or we treat sacrifice as a whole kind of like a net zero loss. And that's just not the way it is. By definition, a sacrifice is to make something holy. It's to make something, um, it's to do something holy. It's to offer something holy. As holy. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote these words in Ephesians chapter 5. Check this out. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself, notice this, as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. You see, Paul was making the point, not only did Jesus sacrifice for you and sacrifice for me, but when you sacrifice, when you, like the person on the other side of this message, the person on the other side of this audio or this video, when you sacrifice, it actually makes you more like Christ. It makes you more like Jesus. And then to add further to it, not only, not only does sacrifice make you more like Jesus, but it takes the thing that you are sacrificing and it makes it holy before the Lord. When you sacrifice, it takes that thing that you are sacrificing, that money, that time, that energy, that relationship, that resource, and it makes that 
holy before the Lord. You see, when you commit to sacrificing for the sake of our church community, what you are doing, and I'm speaking specific to those of us here at Meta Church, when you commit to sacrificing for the sake of our church community, for the Meta Church community, what you're doing is you're making this space and this place and these people sacred and holy before God and before one another. When you are sacrificing, when you are sacrificing for the sake of our church community, you are taking and you are making this space and this place and these people sacred and holy before God and before each other. You see, our collective sacrifices as individuals makes our church community better as a whole. When each and every one of us sacrifices, it makes our church community better as a whole. Those of us who are part of Meta Church today, those of us who are here today, have been served by the sacrifices that have been made by numerous, countless individuals over the years and in the past. And it's those sacrifices that have allowed us to, have, to be blessed by the incredible community that we have. Our community has been made better because other people have sacrificed. But like I said last week, our church is nowhere near the potential of who we can become. In fact, we have the foundations and the makings of an incredible community. But I also believe, and I know this to be true, we've got more in us than what we're offering or than what we are contributing at this current moment. See, and that's why I want to exhort us and I want to kind of challenge and, and provoke our church to desire more and to become more, to be willing to sacrifice today for the opportunity to walk in our potential tomorrow. I love this quote by Charles Dickens. He says this, the important thing is this, to be ready at any moment to sacrifice what you are today for what you could become tomorrow. You see, if we as a church are ever going to become the community that we believe we could become, then it's going to require that everyone who calls Meta Church home, that everyone who calls this community their community, um, to sacrifice in order to make it happen. And what I want to do for the remainder of our time is just share with you a few different ways that you can sacrifice, a few different areas that you might consider that God might want to challenge you or to speak into where you can sacrifice either at a higher level or begin sacrificing at in order to make our community better so that we can trade up for the next version of ourselves better and believe and fulfill the potential that we believe God has for our church. So here's the first area I'll speak to, and that's the area of time. Time, T-I-M-E. Now, it's difficult to identify anything as valuable or as finite as our time. It's the one commodity that we cannot make more of. And at the same time, simultaneously, it's one, the one asset that we all have the same amount of. No one, no one got more time yesterday than I did. And no one is getting more time today than I will. At least not in the sense of like in, in theory, right? Like, there's 24 hours. There's not more time that you can like kind of squeeze out of the day. So it's limited and yet it's equal. So what we do with our time is of utmost importance. How we use our time, where we use our time is crucial. It's critical. That's why the psalmist wrote this, Psalm 90 verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. His prayer, the psalmist was writing and singing about, God, I, this, this time that I have, it's limited. It's finite. And so God, give me the wisdom to know how to use it. Give me the wisdom to understand where to leverage it. Help me to take account for the fact that like, I don't just have all this time available at my disposal and it's just this kind of like infinite resource. God, it's finite. And so help me steward it, help me use it well. And the same should be true for us as a community, that we should sacrifice our time, that we should look at the things that we commit to, the things that we do as a means of offering a sacrifice to God when it comes to this church community. And I'll give you a few different examples, right? Like, so again, just kind of like broad level, like attending church, church online, coming to church in person, like that's a sacrifice of sorts. You making it a priority, you showing up, you being engaged, you being locked in on that. That's a sacrifice saying, God, no, I'm going to prioritize this time, this space to connect with God and to connect with my community. So attending is a means of that. Um, you know, again, connecting specifically, kind of taking it a step further, connecting 
It is like going beyond just like, oh, I just showed up. It's like, no, I'm actually trying to build in here. I'm trying to build in relationship. I'm trying to build in with the community. I'm trying to actually engage in people's lives. And so I'm going to commit time to that. I'm not just going to run off or I'm not just going to kind of like check a box or say, okay, well, I watch church online, but I'm not engaged in what else is happening at Meta Church. Like, no, like that connection requires time. And that's a form of sacrifice that you can make. Of course, there's the opportunity to serve or to contribute in some way where you say, you know, I'm going to like be invested in a way that makes an impact, in a way that makes a difference. And so by doing that, I'm going to be able to, to give of my time. You say, well, Ricky, I'm not in New York City. What do I do or how do I do this? Well, look, you have your neighborhood. You have your community. You have your city. You have your area where there's opportunities. You can find local resources, nonprofits, organizations. There's plenty of organizations in need of volunteer help. And so if you don't like the type of person that says, well, I know exactly what I'll do. I'll start this thing or I have this initiative that I'm a part of. Just do a quick Google search. If you need help, reach out to me. I'm happy to help you find an area where you can use your time and make a sacrifice in a way that contributes and makes a difference in the lives of the people God has placed near you or around you. So serving is a great way to sacrifice your time. It actually kind of lends itself to the next one, which is skills, right? Like skills, it's not just about sacrificing your time, but sacrificing your skills. You know, we all have different abilities and skills that can be used to benefit our church community, to benefit Meta Church. And, and this is on purpose. God has designed it this way and, so that we could fulfill his purposes. You know, I think about uh, someone who's part of our church online community, Ollie and, and, and Rich Young out in uh, Camas, Washington. And Ollie is um, someone, I remember when I first started student ministry out there in Camas, Washington, Ollie was like, you know, just this administrative uh, beast, which he's probably like, like what in the world? Like she was just so good at making sure things were organized and, and structured properly. And it was a massive blessing to me as a 22, 23 year old kid trying to figure out how to lead a, a group of teenagers and volunteers and, 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 and plan and, and, and do things. But she had skills that she was able to utilize to help me and to help our community grow and thrive. And so all of us have these skills. And I, I love this example from Exodus 35, 35. Um, God had instructed Moses and the people of Israel to begin building and constructing a tabernacle, like a portable place of worship while they were out wandering through the desert. And this is what it says in Exodus 35, 35, because, you know, if God comes to you and says in the middle of the desert, hey, I want you to build um, this makeshift tent that's going to be, you know, packed up and made of all like these fine linens and fine jewels um, and, and needs to be built to these specifications and you need to be able to like set it up and tear it down. If, it, if that were me, I'm like, how? I can't do all that, God. And then this is what God says to Moses. The Lord has given them, all these people, special skills as engravers, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet thread on fine linen cloth and weavers. They excel as craftsmen and as designers. See, God had already positioned Moses and Moses, don't worry about it. There's a bunch of people here. And they're going to be sacrificing the skills that they have to make this happen. And the same is true for our church community. See, rather, I think here, here's what I re realized. A lot of people think of their skills primarily as a means to advance their career or advance their position or advance their influence kind of like out in the world. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, ex that's, that's a great leverage and use of your skills. But there's so much more opportunity beyond like just your personal benefit in work or career. See, I think our skills are actually something that can be used within the church to make a difference, to make a difference, you know, to build um, God's church and to advance his kingdom. These skills aren't just one dimensional or, or, or just kind of um, solely related to our places of employment. God has given us these skills to build this church, to advance the kingdom and to make a difference in our places of work. And so these skills are, are, are crucial and important. Again, I'll just kind of throw this out there. Listen, if you're like, oh, okay, well, I have these skills. I don't know where I could use them in the church. Then reach out to me. Let me know. I'd be happy to help engage you. If you're like, okay, well, where can I get involved? We have different teams. We have different serving teams that you could help with. Or there's ministry ideas. We've helped other people kind of identify like their makeup and, and, and how God has designed them and where they can use those skills to make a difference in the church, outside of the church. But you have skills. And so when you can sacrifice those skills for the sake of our church community, we all get better. So we talked about our time. We've talked about our skills. But then here's the third area, our finances. Our finances. And I know, listen, this, is, this can be a sensitive one. In fact, about a year ago, I, I preached a message 
on sacrificing financially. I preached a message here at Meta Church about sacrificing financially, and a few people got really upset about it and decided they were never going to come back to Meta Church ever again because of it. Because I said that we should sacrifice, that everyone should sacrifice financially. Now, I don't want to make them seem like bad people, so it's not really about um, you know those people and their decision. But but the truth be told, I I just don't get that attitude. I just don't get that mindset of like no like. You shouldn't tell me that I should have to sacrifice financially to make this church community better. I mean, practically speaking, okay, just practically speaking, how would a church operate without the financial gifts and the financial sacrifice of its people? Like, how would the church do ministry? We do food distribution. We do rental assistance. We provide free haircuts. Like, those things cost money. And so how would we be able to fund those things? How would we be able to finance those things if people didn't sacrifice financially? We have a building where we meet, a venue where we meet. That costs rent. We don't own that space. We, don't, um, we, we have to rent that space. So that costs money. So people have to sacrifice financially. That's like the practical side of it. But then theologically and historically speaking, Christians and the church have always, always been characterized by their generosity and their financial sacrifice. Again, I'll go back to the scriptures and what the Apostle Paul wrote. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 3 and 4. This is what Paul was writing to one church about another church. This is what Paul said about one group of Christians to another group of Christians. He says this, For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. That sounds like a sacrifice to me. And they did it of their own free will. Notice this. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Like there was a group of Christians who were so eager to give financially. They didn't just give the minimum. They didn't just give like, oh, here's a dollar and that'll kind of take care of it. They gave sacrificially above and beyond what that was expected of them. And they said they begged to be able to give multiple times. Hey, how can we help? Hey, how can we give? Hey, how can we contribute? How can we sacrifice? Where can we um, put more into the pot, so to speak? That's how Christians were marked in the early church. And I believe that's how Christians at Meta Church should be marked as well. That we should be committed financially to sacrifice and to invest in what's going on. That we should be known for our willingness and our eagerness to financially sacrifice to make this community better. And listen, again, I'll just say it practically. Like at Meta Church, everything we do and everything that's happening has been, been made possible because other people and people today at Meta Church are financially sacrificing to make it happen. The reason we're able to do the ministry that we do, the reason we're able to make the difference that we make is because people today and people in the past have financially sacrificed to make it so. And listen, if you're not a part of that or if you haven't been a part of that, it's really easy. There's kind of a few different steps you can take, right? You can start to give. If you don't, if you've never given or if you haven't given, you can start to give financially to Meta Church. If you do give, but it's kind of on occasion or, or, or spontaneous or sporadic or inconsistent, then you can start giving regularly and you can start financially sacrificing on a regular basis to be more consistent and more frequent in that. And if you give regularly, maybe it's time to kind of take the step to start giving generously, to be like these Christians here where it says they didn't just give what they could afford, but far more. And so whatever you're at on the spectrum, we all can sacrifice. We all can make a financial contribution to sacrifice to what God is doing here at Meta Church. So we covered three of the four, but now here is the fourth and final one. Um, that is the area of our preferences. Our preferences. Now, we may not consciously think of it, but every healthy community requires that the community members sacrifice some level of preference, of personal preference, to make that community healthy and whole. Inevitably, and here's why, inevitably there will be moments circumstances, and decisions that are made that do not align with our personal preferences, which means we will be confronted with a choice. When a circumstance, a decision, or a moment is experienced that does not align with my personal preference, I am faced with a choice. Will I push away from it or push against it, or will I choose to lay down my personal preference and say, okay, if this is the way we're going, let me align myself with it. It may not align with my preference, but I can align myself with it so that we can make this community better. And, and in truth be told, this is where it gets sticky in a church setting. And, and I've been in church settings for a long time, so, I, so I'm well aware that when preferences, when people don't have or experience it or, or see their preferences come to fruition, they take it very personal 
And oftentimes people get quite upset about it. Maybe even in some cases, people resulting in people choosing to leave and no longer being a part of that community. But the reality is that we all have to sacrifice personal preferences if we want what's best for our community. All of us. And this includes me. This includes me. I'll give you a few examples just over the past few years. You see, there's preferences that I have that we aren't able to do or we haven't been able to do. So for, for example, here, church online. I love that we have an online church community. I love that we have people from all over the country watching, engaging, part of the Meta Church family. But I would much prefer for, for this to be kind of like a live stream where you could see our Sunday environment where our people could connect to what's happening in the room Sundays at Meta Church rather than pre-recording this message for you guys. And yeah, like this works and it's functional and, and it's suited, but I would prefer something different. But we don't have the capacity, we don't have the manpower, or the team, or, or, or the capability just yet to be able to live stream something from a Sunday. So this is the better way to go about it. And this serves our community best. It provides a level of quality. It provides a level of intimacy, a level of connection that could not be afforded or provided otherwise. And so this serves our community best. So my preference would be something else, but this is what serves our community best. So this is the way that we do it. Another example, for five years, the better part of five years, Meta Church only did, or pretty much only did, video worship. Well, truth be told, that wasn't my preference. That's not what I personally preferred. I would prefer live worship. I would prefer like a band or a team. Um, and that was my preference, but we didn't have that. We didn't have that capability. We didn't have those people. And so my preferences had to be laid down in order to do what serves our community best. And so video worship allowed for that. Video worship created that. There are other ministry opportunities that present themselves where, hey, Meta Church, could you guys be involved? Just in the last two weeks, someone um, offered or presented an idea to me. And I'm like, man, I'd love to do that, but we don't have the ability, we don't have the margin to do that today. And so my preference would be to do that ministry but we don't have the margin or the, the, the capacity to do it today. So, so we had to say, well, I can't do this right now or we can't do this right now, but maybe in the future we can. And so those kinds of things are, are all things that I would prefer to do. Like my preference is, is, is something else, but it doesn't align with my preference. So I have to say, well, am I just going to be like, well, well, the church isn't doing this, so i got to push away. No, like I say, this serves our community best right now. And so I can lay aside my personal preference because I recognize and I understand like, hey, this is what's going to help our community. This is what's going to make our community healthier and better and whole. And again, the Apostle Paul was no different. He felt the same tension. He experienced the same thing. He wrote this, 1 Corinthians 9, 22. When I am weak with, or when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. You think Paul was interested in like, you think his preference was to feel weak? No, but he shared his weakness with those who were weak. He says, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. What he was saying is that, listen, my preferences don't matter. If this is what this community needs, if this is what serves this community better, if this is the way I can engage with this community, then like I'm willing to lay those preferences aside, recognizing that this is going to lead people to Jesus, recognizing that this is going to lead people to transformation. And that's the thing, Meta Church. We're not trying to manipulate people. We're not trying to control people. We're simply saying, listen, we got to sacrifice our personal preference with the recognition and the perspective that this is ultimately going to help people experience the transformative power of Jesus in their lives and that's what we're about and that's why we're willing to make these types of sacrifices you know i think about the sacrifices that have been made up to this point to allow us to be where we are today the financial sacrifices the times that have been sac the time that has been sacrificed the skills that have been sacrificed the preferences that have been sacrificed and i'm forever grateful for those things to all of you who have been a part of it, to so all of you who have contributed. I'm so, so grateful for you and the sacrifices that you've made. And I realize that I've been blessed by it. And I pray and I trust that you've been blessed by it as well. But I can't help but wonder, who will be blessed on the other side of the sacrifices we choose to make today? Who else can be blessed by the sacrifices that we choose to make? What strangers will become friends? What lost people will be found? What lives will be impacted because people in this community chose to sacrifice their time, their skills, their finances, and their preferences? What eternities will be changed because we chose and we choose to sacrifice who we are today for who we could become tomorrow?
Meta Church, we have a great opportunity before us. And as I close, here's what I wanna invite you to do. We have that digital connection card. And if you haven't taken a second to fill it, I wanna invite you to do so now. On there, you'll see a spot where God says something like, God is speaking to me about, and there's these four areas listed. And you can check any or all that apply. But as your pastor, I wanna know, how is God speaking to you? Is God speaking to you about your time? Is he speaking to you about your finances? Is he speaking to you about your preferences or your skills? I want to know, and I want to be able to support you. I want to come alongside of you. I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you in that. And so I want to encourage you now to fill out that connection card and to let us know how God is speaking to you so that we can rally around you. Because listen, if our community is going to become the potential or live into the potential of who we could become, it's going to require you and me and the person next to us choosing to sacrifice who we are today so that we can become who we believe we should be tomorrow. Let me pray for us and then we'll step into a time of worship. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this word, the way you are speaking to our church, the way you are shaping us, uh, the way you are inviting us to greater sacrifice, to make a greater impact. Lord, I pray that we would respond in faith and in obedience. I pray that we would um, commit to the sacrifices, whatever areas uh, you are uh, speaking to us about, Lord, that we would um, engage in that and that we would um, pursue that at a higher level and with greater commitment, knowing, God, that who we are tomorrow or who we can become tomorrow is so much greater than who we are today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.